Capacity Working Group. Uh, it's a joint venture. I'm Lee Drutman. I'm the uh, senior fellow in the political reform program at New America. This is a joint venture with the R Street Institute, uh, who has sent a senior fellow, James Walner, to talk to us a little bit about the Senate and Senate procedure. Uh, and then Molly Reynolds, who's a fellow at the uh, Brookings Institution, will offer some commentary. Uh, James has written a book. You want to hold up your book? Actually, you a copy? Robert. All right, well, Molly has a copy uh, on yes. parliamentary war. You're welcome. Uh, politics by other means, or war by other means, it's politics, or anyway. So, without further ado, let's jump into the conversation. Do you want to go? Like you can go first. You want to start? Yeah, I'll go first. All right. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody, for coming uh, to a conversation about the Senate on the House side. Um, <laughs> but I think this is especially relevant today for the House because a lot of the consternation and concern about what's happening in the Senate or not happening, I should say, really originates over here. And what you see in the Senate is a bunch of people who complain and are frustrated about the place, but yet aren't frustrated enough to actually do anything about it. Um, and so what I thought we would do today is just talk briefly about how I see the, the Senate and see the problems that result from um, the current situation and then maybe how best to solve them. In this book, it really arose out of my, and I know many of you, it rose out of my time on the Hill in trying to reconcile uh, the way I thought about the Senate and how it works with uh, the reality of what I saw on the ground. And the idea is that in the lead up to the use of the nuclear option in November of 2013, that you just had so much obstruction that the, minority, the majority just had no other, no other possible option but to just nuke the filibuster, right? because they couldn't do anything. And this was odd to, to those of us who were on the ground in the Senate at the time because there wasn't a lot of obstruction, at least successful obstruction. In fact, every time uh, the nuclear option was threatened, it appeared that the, the majority got what they wanted, which was enough uh, members of the minority party to break ranks and vote for cloture and to invoke cloture and move on. And so therefore, you never saw this obstruction that actually that everybody kept talking about. And then when the nuclear option finally did happen in November of that year, it came out of nowhere. I mean, we had a government shutdown. We had the debt ceiling. Nobody was really talking about it. I think there was a few uh, rumblings here and there. Um, but nothing, not a sustained push, nothing at all. And then literally, like, we, you came to work one day, and they're like, tomorrow they're going to use the nuclear option. And it was like, what? Why? And it was, again, I think it was a threat, and it was designed to get the members of the minority party who would break ranks to break ranks, but this time they didn't. And so this got me asking, well, what's going on here? Why is this actually happening? Um, and as someone who was in the, um, working for senators in the minority party at the time, I was very frustrated because it seemed like the minority party was constantly getting rolled. And so I began to look into it and began to think through this whole thing, and then I ended up going into this um, kind of, a, you know, through the looking glass, if you will, and trying to understand the real nature of the Senate and how it operates. And not to belabor the discussion, and we can get into it in questions and answers after Molly's um, comment, it really drew my attention to how the Senate operates in terms of uh, everyday business. And right now, we have a Senate that operates by unanimous consent. And they do so because they don't want to put in the effort required to legislate. And if if any of you have ever worked in the Senate or studied it closely for a long time, you'll know that it's really hard to obstruct things. And basically, it's hard because it takes a lot of effort and resources. It the, the majority can impose cost on you for obstructing. And that makes it hard for individual senators, for members, for people to do it. They don't want to do it. For those of you, the staff in the room, you know when you push your member to do something, and then the whole world comes down on them very quickly, um, their enthusiasm for doing that thing goes away. Now, <laughs> multiply that times a million, and, and you get the, the situation where like, they can do what they want to do, but they've also got to sit on the floor, and they've got to speak. And I think this gets to a lot of the problems that we see today, and also that we saw in 2013. 
uh, which is that the only reason the minority is able to stop things these days, at least, is because the majority seems willing to allow it to do so. The majority seems willing to allow it to, um, to have costless obstruction, if you will. And no, I'm not talking about the nuclear option. What I'm talking about is they're not forcing the minority to bear the cost. And in, with regard to the minority, they have rights, but they've got to assert those rights. And the way that the Senate ultimately operates, it doesn't follow the rules. It never follows the rules. It operates by unanimous consent. And so the question becomes, how do you establish an equilibrium in that environment off the floor so the members can negotiate with each other on a relative basis of equality? And that comes down to ultimately recognizing what those tools are, how they can exert um, their own interest in the chamber, and how they can force the other side to deal with them, how they can make them pay a cost for either obstructing if you're in the, in the minority or rolling the minority if you're in the majority. And that's what I try to get at in the book and I outline some various tactics like third degree amendments and other things. Um, but just to show that there's certain ways in which the majority can't ultimately clamp down on things. And this is the last point I'll make. We have this notion of, oh, well, if the majority will only go nuclear, everything will be fine, right? Then everything will be fine depending on what you believe. If you don't support the current majority, then it won't be fine. But everything will be fine because the majority will be able to pass its agenda. But that's not entirely the case because there's some things the majority can't do. And I think the biggest distinction between the House and the Senate as I see it is not the presence of the filibuster. It's the requirement that the vice president is the presiding officer. There is no speaker of the House, if you will. Um, and because of that, there's no one person that the chamber can delegate authority to, can delegate power to, to govern things and keep order. In the House, as you know, if you, the speaker does something wrong, then you get a new speaker. Can't do that in the Senate. And so because of that, the Senate historically has never delegated that kind of power to their presiding officer because they can't control who it is. It'd be like saying if Chuck Schumer is the majority leader, we're going to let Mike Pence decide who to recognize. This is not going to happen. And if the presiding officer is going to continue to be able to recognize whoever he or she wants or any senator will be able to get recognized, then you have access to these other procedures. And if you have 20 senators as opposed to 41, you can force roll call votes on them. <coughs> and last time I checked, that's what senators really hate doing is voting. Um, and so if you can force these votes on things, you ultimately can begin to re uh, restore a lot of the equilibrium and a lot of the balance. And then you get back to a more productive Senate. And I think that's the way to ultimately fix the place and, and get back to actually lawmaking um, versus nuking the filibuster, which I think only ends in more kind of dysfunction down the road. So. All right. Thank you. Um, like we said, my name is Molly Reynolds. I'm a fellow um, at Brookings, and I'm really glad to be here today to chat a little bit about um, James's book and uh, James's work. Uh, so I just want to start by saying that um, James has a more encyclopedic knowledge of the Senate than um, virtually anyone else I've ever met. Um, and it's on full display in this book. Um, the exploration of majority and minority party strategy, which is some of what he talked about in his opening comments, um, that's uh, it's really quite thought provoking. But even if you don't want to go all the way down that rabbit hole, um, the chapter in the book that's just an overview of um, the procedural architecture of the Senate is one of the clearest and most concise explanations of that that I've read. So I commend that to you. And um, the two chapters that talk about uh, the uh, run up to the 2005 non use of the nuclear option and the 2013 use of the nuclear option um, brought me back to some details that I had not remembered or never known in some cases. Uh, so I just want to uh, start by saying that. So I thought what I'd do is talk a little bit about what I see as kind of the contribution of this work um, that James is doing. Then I'm going to lay out a couple of questions that maybe he'll respond to or not. He can ignore them. Um, and to start our conversation. And then I am going to wrap up with just a few thoughts on what I think James's work says about perhaps the future of the filibuster in the near term in the Senate. So um, prior to James writing this book, um, and he articulates as well, there are sort of two ways that political scientists, um, of which I am one, uh, tend to think about procedural change in the Senate. So there's kind of one school of thought that emphasizes uh, that threats by the majority to use the nuclear option to change the rules are what keep the minority from obstructing too much, and that's what forces compromise. 
There's another school of thought that says that actually it's pretty hard to change the rules, and so what prevents the majority from doing that is an anticipation of what the minority would do in response. Um, and so both of these perspectives suggest that the only thing that's gonna get us less obstruction in the long term is for the fundamental political realities in which we live to change. So James comes in with what I think is a really helpful and more nuanced perspective that focuses on how the outcome of these procedural conflicts really depends on what both sides are doing. He also talks a lot about the role of credible commitment so that it matters whether both sides believe that the other side is actually gonna follow through on the threat that they're making. So you actually have to have, if you're gonna to threaten to do something, you actually have to have the votes to do it or you have to have the senators who are going to engage in whatever is necessary to carry out that strategy for that threat to be credible. Um, so James talks about how we're more likely to see procedural change when the parties are polarized, um, when the minority is engaging in a high level of obstruction, and when the majority is really determined to enact its agenda. Um, we can still see, though, the majority de um, deterred from going nuclear, when the minority is threatening to impose significant costs on the majority. Um, and importantly, I think this is one of the real insights of the book, is that for um, the minority to deter the majority, whatever it is that the minority is threatening to do can't itself be limited by the nuclear option. So James mentioned um, the part of the book where he talks about, for instance, third degree amendments and some other tactics that the minority could use um, to retaliate against the majority, that the majority couldn't also limit using the nuclear option. So when I think about kind of the history of procedural change in the Senate um, over particularly the latter half of the 20th and the early 21st century, I think a lot of sort of a, a, a tit for tat type um, situation where the majority does something, uh, the minority retaliates, the majority does something else, the minority retaliates. And so it's important that the minority have, when we think about this, we have to think about what tools the minority has that can't themselves be restricted using uh, the nuclear option. So um, now I'm just going to sort of put a few questions in front of um, James that he can respond to and that we can think about in our discussion. So my first question is, how should we think about individual senators' political goals in this context? So one of the things that James talks about in the book is an important difference between what happened in 2005 and what happened in 2013 is that the overall Senate environment changed such that members weren't by 2013, getting to exercise their personal power as much. So they were more comfortable with changing the rules in order to give up whatever hypothetical individual power they had to achieve partisan goals, because they weren't getting to use that individual power um, as frequently. So from my perspective, I would almost have expected the opposite to have been true, um, that as other opportunities for senators to influence the process declined, Senators would see their ability to obstruct or to hold out for concessions as the only way to get what they want. And so that would make them less likely to be willing um, to go, uh, to vote, um, to go nuclear. So I'd be curious to hear your response to that. Um, next question is, <clears throat> what's the, for you, what's kind of the connection between procedure and policy? So my brain naturally goes here because much of my own work is on how Congress develops special procedures for particular pieces of legislation. So things like the budget reconciliation process, fast track trade agreements, the super committee, that sort of thing. So when James talks about policy in the book, it's largely in um, terms of the role of the overall agenda. So the idea that if the majority has other things it wants to do that might be jeopardized by retaliation by the minority, they would be less likely to go nuclear because they're afraid of, um, of what the minority would do in response. So part of what led Republic, the Republican majority to compromise in 2005 was that it had other things it wanted to do that it couldn't do without Democratic votes. So how much of um, the desire to actually confirm the underlying judges was at play here? So are we supposed to think that getting those judges on the court was more important to Democrats in 2013 than it was to Republicans in 2005? Um, and generally, in your framework, how should we think about how the desire to get an underlying policy goal achieved? How does that play into these questions of um, parliamentary conflict? So 
The last question for you is, so I just talked a little bit about the role of the external agenda, so what the majority wants to do beyond the issues that actually generate the confrontation. So I want to pose sort of an alternative, or what I see as an alternative explanation for the difference between 2005 and 2013, which is that in 2005, Republicans were concerned that Democrats wouldn't cooperate on other priorities if they went nuclear. But by 2013, um, Democrats had no reason to expect that Republicans were going to be particularly cooperative whether or not they invoked the nuclear option. So I'd just be curious um, to hear your reaction to that. So we have James a chance to collect um, some thoughts on those questions and reflect a little bit on what his argument says about the future of the filibuster on legislation. So what, one um, big thing that I uh, thought of when I was thinking about this is one thing I think we've seen so far this Congress is that Republicans have, in the Senate have, tried to <coughs> have decided to try and get as much mileage as they can out of non-filibusterable items. So nominations, reconciliation bills, resolutions under the Congressional Review Act. Um, so from my perspective, they were largely able to avoid some of this parliamentary war that uh, James talks about in the first session of the 115th con Congress because of how they steered the agenda. Um, the place where I think we've seen the most conversation in the Senate around an additional change to the filibuster um, on the legislation side is obviously around appropriations bills. And so I would um, speculate that one potential lesson from our brief January shutdown is that the current minority party can, in fact, be persuaded to sacrifice the appropriations process in pursuit of other policy goals, sometimes, uh, which under James's logic would suggest that they might be willing to retaliate against effort to use the nuclear option on appropriations bills. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that James also argues that one of the conditions necessary for procedural change is that the majority party is really determined to enact its agenda. So I think as we're thinking about the future of the legislative filibuster, we should pay attention to whether the majority party is actually unified around a set of policy goals that it really wants to achieve badly enough to, um, to limit the filibuster in pursuit of them. So I'll stop there. I'll give you maybe a couple minutes to respond, and then we'll open up for questions. Wonderful. Thank you. And if you haven't read Molly's book, I highly recommend it. It's very, very good. Um, very quickly here, and I think this has a lot of bearing, in this, in especially with what you ended on, because there's a lot of talk now about how Republicans need to go further and, and maybe nuke the motion to proceed to appropriations bills or something else, because the Democrats are going to do it anyway, right? This is the argument, particularly among conservatives. And they say, we don't want it to happen, but at the same time, they're going to do it anyway, so we have to. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? The nuclear option is going to be used. It's just that they're going to be the ones to do it. Um, I think very briefly, it, when it comes to Senator's goals and, and, and how they see the problem and whether or not it makes them more or less willing to go nuclear. I think it's the leaders and, and everything around uh, the, in the Senate, and this I think is probably familiar to, you, to people here in the House, everything is defined in terms of team play. They spend a lot of time on that. So that the problem becomes the other side, right? When you meet in lunches, the problem becomes the other side and they're obstructing and you can't ever achieve whatever it is that you want to do as long as the other side can obstruct. Right? And so I think what it does is it lends uh, itself to defining or it encourages the members to see themselves as part of this team and this team is the only solution. In the Senate, that is a very alien concept. I understand here in the House it makes a lot of sense. In the Senate, it has never really been that way, at least to my knowledge. I mean, the individual strain of, of senators uh, thinking and how they see the world has always been a very prominent factor, but that's no longer the case. It's increasingly um, being replaced by this more corporate identity. Uh, with regard to the, to the connection between a procedure and policy, um, I would add that I don't... I don't think that it's that, in, let's put it this way, if it was truly important, right, that they, what they're going for, what, they, what the majority wants, and why they're threatening the nuclear option, then they could easily, I think, with the existing procedures that they have, communicate that importance. And the act of communicating that importance would signal to the minority, or at least enough members of the minority, that they were serious about doing this and therefore they ought to negotiate, either because it's gonna happen anyway and we wanna make sure we get a slice of the pie or we wanna make it as least bad as possible or we're gonna lose the filibuster if not. In fact, it, and so it's the complete, I think it's the opposite. It's the, it's the apathy 
It's the lack of any kind of willingness to do anything um, that, that ultimately, I think, it drives people towards the nuclear option, if that, if that makes sense. I don't know. Um, and, and, it's a way, and it's a way to achieve their goals without putting in any effort, I think. And they, they talk about it. But I, but I think you also need to consider this in the concept of uh, the politics more broadly. It's a lot easier to, to blame the minority when you have the filibuster than it is to blame uh, the minority when you don't have a filibuster. And you saw this with the health care fight and reconciliation um, recently in the, in the, in the Senate. Um, and then lastly, with regard to cooperation, um, I think this gets into how the minority threatens to respond. Because the minority has power here. I mean, my whole point is that the minority is not powerless. It's not walking around with its hat looking for crumbs from the majority. It has an ability, not as great, because it's the minority, OK. But it has an ability to ultimately to, to get something, to set the game in a way that it can prevail in some things. And ultimately, the minority in, 20, in 2005 behaved differently than the, major, than the minority in 2013. But so did the majority. And in 2005, you see this very clearly, the fear was, and for those who were around them, the fear was among the Republicans who ultimately uh, joined the Gang of 14, that the Democrats would ultimately retaliate, block everything, and that would lead to pressure to nuke the legislative filibuster. Right? That was the fear, that the judges would lead to bills. And then in 2013, what you saw was th many of those very same members, right, when they're now in the minority, what were they doing? They were threatening to nuke the legislative filibuster if they ever got back in the majority. So Reed, it seems to me, didn't have the votes to go nuclear until the very last minute. And how the minority responded helped give him the votes. People like Dianne Feinstein were not thrilled about going nuclear. But what happened? You turn on the TV, you see Lamar Alexander on the floor. What is he saying? He's saying, if you do this, we're not going to do X, Y, and Z to make your life miserable now, to increase the cost now. We're going to pass Yucca Mountain. <laughs> right? So you see the number one like, person who people identify with being opposed to the nuclear option, saying we shouldn't do the nuclear option, saying we're going to use the nuclear option to nuke the filibuster. And all of a sudden, you, that then gives your, um, the, the liberals in the conference and those pushing for this, that gives them credibility. Because they're saying they're going to do this anyway. And now all of a sudden, they're, the minority is saying, we're going to do this anyway. So of course they're going to, of course it becomes a lot easier to do that. And so I think that's one of the key, I think that's the bigger dynamic than expecting any cooperation. I mean, it seems to me that if you look back, there were, to the extent that the minority and the majority, I mean, they cooperated on numerous things, right? And certainly, I mean, I think the same thing now. I think there was a lot more cooperation than we typically think and give it credit for. And the things that they, didn't cooperate on, I don't think we're realistic to expect cooperation in the first place. I don't know. Yeah. No. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we should open it up for questions then. Uh, and uh, when you ask a question, please let us know who you are. Uh, Kirk? Kirk Gaussman with Defense Priorities. So the title of the event is the Senate at War With Itself. And it sounds like it's not at war with itself, and that's a bad thing. Is that your view? I mean, yes. Um, <laughs> look, I don't, this comes down to how do you, what's the problem? Is the problem too much conflict or not enough? I don't think there's enough conflict. It seems to me that um, the process should be the resolution of conflict. And you need to give people an ability to force their way into the conversation. If you see the problem as being not enough, con too much conflict, then the answer is give the majority more power. Give the majority more power, and it will be able to ultimately um, you know, either roll over the minority or create special procedures that are rational, that can insulate the process from that conflict. Right? That's, that's the solution. I don't think that ultimately solves the problem, because I think the problem is that we don't have enough conflict and that the members are unwilling to actually engage in the hard act of legislating and the hard work of legislating. Um, because it entails conflict and uncertainty. And until we get back to that, then we're not, you're, the Senate's not going to change. And it doesn't matter if you go to it, in my opinion, I don't think it's going to really make that much of a difference if you go to a 51 vote threshold to end debate on things versus a 60 vote threshold. Um, there are plenty of things that the Senate can do right now to make things difficult. They're whipping a proposal, is my understanding, to reduce the, the post closure time on nominations. To, from 30 hours to something less, like eight, I don't know, maybe going back to what the standing order was before. 
Um, I don't know if that, I think that's a, it's a distraction from the real problem because it, last time I checked the sentence in quorum calls most of the time that you're in post closure time. Um, well, if you're in quorum calls, you can't vote and the Senate precedents require the chair to call a vote if nobody's speaking. So why would a majority who's willing to nuke the, legis the post closure time on nominations simply just stop putting the Senate in a quorum call during post closure time, just as a minimum. Let's just do that first. And then if everybody talks, then maybe there might be a problem and then let's consider, but they don't, they go straight to this. And I think it's a distraction from the real problem, which is the floor no longer serves as a place where decisions are made organically. And the, the current rules and procedures are designed to give the leaders you know, kind of control over everything. So what I, would, uh, what I would add to that is when I think about this question, I generally think about, you know, do actual rank and file senators want more, like, are they generally comfortable with the current equilibrium or would they like something different? Um, and I think, uh, I think James and I agree on the degree to which members um, in both chambers, I think, often don't want to be forced to cast tough votes or make hard choices. And so part of why we have the current situation in the Senate is because senators don't don't want to sort of individual senators don't want to go in a different direction. They don't want to be asked to take difficult votes. They don't want to be asked to make hard choices. And they would and to the extent that they have to do that, they would prefer it happen in a non public way. Yeah, in a I think that's part. I think that's correct um, up to a point. I do think, though, that the social atmosphere matters, and, and for members when they come to the Senate on both sides of the aisle, everything about the place is designed to convince them that they are not as powerful as they are. It's designed to convince them that they don't know what they're talking about. That they should trust the betters, the people who have been there longer, the more responsible, sober people. And then, whenever someone steps out of line and starts to challenge the way the system is made, uh, decisions are made in the place, and challenge the system. Usually what happens is the powers that be, and I don't want to sound too conspiratorial here, but the powers that be try to make an example of that person. Because what they're doing is they're trying to send a signal to everybody else, because in the Senate, no one is in control. No one is in control. There's no, the majority leader doesn't have any real power. Certainly nothing that can't be challenged on a daily basis by any group of senators. And 20 senators, as I show in the book, can throw a wrench into the whole thing and cause royal mess. Any senator can move to proceed to bills. Any senator can offer an amendment whenever they want. You can do whatever you want if you're a senator in the Senate, and you can get a vote on that if you have 20 sen members that will second you, or 19, I guess you get to second yourself. So in that environment, you need to convince people not to do it. And so you create the perception that it will be chaos and, and destruction, and the republic will fall into the ocean if, if someone goes down and makes a motion to proceed to a bill other than the majority leader. I remember in, um, in oh, I guess it was 2010 maybe, it was the unemployment insurance extension and the dot fix fight, the perpetual one, and whether or not it should be offset. And um, Senator Coburn at the time wanted to make a motion to proceed to an offset version of this package. And he was just gonna do it. And then he had a cloture petition and he had it signed by enough members and he was gonna go on the floor and he was gonna do it. And it was the Republican leaders that freaked out. It was the Republican leaders. And it was the Republican leaders that tried to convince him not to. And if you go look in the record, you'll see that that motion to proceed was in fact made, but look who made it. It wasn't Coburn, it was McConnell. Because once you realize that the member's gonna go ahead and do it anyway, then the next thing to do is say, well, I will make the motion to proceed as the minority leader. Because that allows you to preserve some semblance of like leadership control and work with the majority leader. The last thing you want is Coburn doing it on this thing. And the next thing you know, Jim DeMint will do it on this thing. And then Jeff Sessions will do it on this other thing. And then Bernie Sanders will do it on something. And then Debbie Stabenow will do it on something. And it starts to spiral. And then all of a sudden you have to actually debate <clears throat> and you have to have votes and you have to do all these things. And leaders, and this isn't a malicious thing, they have a hard job. They're looking at the situation and they're trying to control an uncontrollable situation with no power. Right? And so what they do is they create the environment in which members think that if they go forward with this, it's going to result in worse outcomes than what they already have. I think the problem is it's hard to imagine how it gets any worse. Yeah. Right? I mean, I don't know where it goes from here. Uh, David Rushman, Jeff Wallace, office. Following that logic, could you talk about um, 
how do you think that played out with the recent uh, DACA fight on the Senate floor where there were high hopes, this guy did not before him, that maybe this was going to be a chance where they could do some of the, the fighting that you're talking about, but then when it actually happened, none of that really, it, it stayed all behind the scenes for like three days, and then it came out, everyone realized this was a big failure, so nothing happened. Do you have any? Right, no, it's, this is where, to end the shutdown, apparently, uh, the, uh, the Majority Leader Mitch McConnell pledged to the Minority Leader Chuck Schumer that he would allow an open debate on the Senate floor on DACA. I think the first thing, the first red flag I see there is it's not the Majority Leader's job or, uh, or prerogative to allow or not allow open debate on the Senate floor. I think that's the one takeaway from the, at least that I have from my time in the Senate and, and from the book, is that it's every member can force their way into the conversation when they want. So I mean, that's the first thing, that's the first red flag that should go off. The, the second is that even if he wanted to, there's other people that can throw a wrench in the process because it, the Senate basically operates by unanimous consent today. So it's not entirely within his power to do so, even if he wanted to. Um, I think the third thing was he, he didn't want to. <laughs> and, nothing, and, and, and nothing in the Senate over the past three and a half, four years suggests that that kind of thing would happen. Um, nothing. And, What's odd about the shutdown fight is that the Republicans brag that they got out of the shutdown with only having given the Democrats a vote on DACA. It seemed a bit odd. I'm like, well, why do you have to shut the government down to give, just give them a vote, right? I mean, just, this is the Senate after all, right? But you don't have to force them to shut the government down. And then the Democrats bragged and said, well, we got out of, we got a commitment to vote on DACA, right? Well, why did you have to shut the government down to do that, right? You could have just forced the vote. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, as many of you know, I think shutdowns are an interesting thing. And, and, and I think a lot of the problems with Congress and its inability to exercise the power of the purse today is because they have now been seen as illegitimate in some way, that there always has to be funded. So it encourages one side of the equation to say, under no circumstances will we vote for that if you um, put it on a government appropriations bill, and then that means that the other side of the majority can't muster the votes to pass it, then you get a shutdown. And if you think shutdowns are bad, then you're basically empowering the side who says, I'm not gonna vote for that bill under any circumstances. Um, but the problem is you can't really exercise the power of the purse in that environment. I mean, the power of the purse and ambition counteracting ambition implies ugly, messy fights. They'll get resolved, but it still means that you should have them. Um, but you, they don't have to have a shutdown. They could just force the vote. And then you get on the DACA bill, and what happens? They fill the tree. And they create the appearance of deliberation. And they create the appearance of a process where people get to participate. But that wasn't it. And McConnell didn't want to do it himself, because that would have been obvious. So what they do is he stands up and he fills the tree. I mean, he offers the First Amendment. Well, he is first recognition. Who gets recognized second in the Senate? Who's the second most powerful senator? Which isn't saying a lot, because most all senators are equal. But who's the second most powerful? Schumer. So what does he do? He gets recognized next and he offers the next amendment, right? Well, then who's the third most powerful senator, right? It was, I think it was Cornyn, right? I mean, Cornyn, but he didn't offer the amendment. I think Grassley, who's the bill manager, who also has priority recognition, stands up and he gets recognized. And he offers an amendment. And then I think it was um, uh, Durbin who offered the second degree. And basically, it created the appearance of all these different members offering amendments. And you have this delivered process. And then once they're pending, they couldn't get consent to schedule votes because members were demanding other things and they wanted to get their way into the situation, but they weren't willing to give them those things and so the whole thing fell apart. Um, but you can imagine a meeting off the floor going, okay guys, this is what we're gonna do. We gotta maintain control of the floor. So I'm gonna offer this amendment and you're gonna offer that amendment, but this is, this literally, I'm sure happened. I mean, this isn't happenstance. And it become, there's a new mindset in the Senate, which is if, when I first started working in the Senate, the floor was always open which means if you were a member and you wanted to go cause havoc and just mess things up, you could. It was always open. Very rarely was it closed. Now, I can't even remember the last time the floor has been literally open. It's gotta be at least six years, maybe, seven years. I mean, this is a dramatic, incredible development. And I think it, and it gets to this, this underlying problem, which is this perception that the Senate can't work unless somebody is in, firmly in control. And, but with things like DACA, um, with other, you can't pass controversial bills, right, in that way. It's just not going to work.
So the one thing um, that I would add the DACA episode um, sort of teaches me is the real difficulty in getting for getting out of kind of the current box um, and the current equilibrium. And so, you know, I I think some of it is um, and. Uh, I think this is consistent with some of what James was saying, is that you know, the current um, membership of the Senate increasingly did not serve in a Senate that worked differently than the one that we have. And so the, uh, even, if you, um, even if you created a situation where um, there was more, the possibility of more open deliberation, everyone's expectations are that things are going to work a certain way. And that's how they ended up working on DACA, which was that there were alternative proposals and they all needed 60 and we had four votes, one after another, and none of them got to 60. And then everyone was like, oh, that was terrible. <laughs> um, and that, that's how it ended. Um, and so the, it's, uh, for me, it's just this, it really reflects this huge challenge of thinking about how we could get off the current equilibrium and into a different one. Josh? Uh, yeah, Introduce uh, yourself. Oh, uh, Josh Heater, Government Affairs Institute at Georgetown University. Um, I had a question for both of you, and I think the DACA point is really, really uh, illuminating for the exact reasons that you two highlight. Uh, James, you're always talking about you want more conflict, but really that means like a different kind of conflict than the one that we're currently enduring, right? There's a, there's a lot of conflict in the Senate, just partisan, right, and leader-driven, as opposed to like membership and membership-driven. And I think the DACA example is a perfect example of, of the type of conflict that people want to have in the Senate currently, right? Um, the shutdown was pointless. It got nothing for Democrats. It, Republicans won effectively nothing from it. Like you said, they could have just forced a vote if they wanted to force a vote. They didn't need to shut the government down in order to do that. But nonetheless, that was the path that we went down, this, this partisan sort of like gamesmanship type of path and type of strategy. And I think uh, what Molly's question highlights is, is maybe uh, a different angle of this, right? And my question is, do you think this is uh, the, the current operation of the Senate is, is partisan and conflictual at a partisan leadership driven level because members want it to be that way? Or is it something more along the lines of what Molly said, that members don't know any better? I think it's all of the above. Um, yeah, I think members who do, who come in and discover they have options and they try to exercise those options, the reaction to that, I think, um, is very fierce and very quick. Um, and that's one thing. I think the other thing is that Parties exist in government to, to basically keep issues that divide them off the agenda. Right? That's their job, right? And so it makes sense that neither side really wants to push immigration at the leadership level, right? It makes sense that um, you know, guns and other issues that are on the public's mind right now are not really being pushed at the leadership level because to do so would expose the divisions within both parties. And I think both parties are much more divided than, they, than we commonly think they are. Um, I've been rethinking my whole um, understanding of <clears throat> uh, polarization, and particularly polarization in, in Congress these days, and I'm not convinced that it explains reality um, uh, very well. I don't, I don't think that the Senate is actually that polarized. And I think that if you were to have a more open and, and, and fluid process where people can kind of clash, I think you'd see that. And even where people disagree, it, there's something about disagreeing with someone, uh, you know, anyone who's married, you know, when you get into an argument, you have to come into, rea into contact with someone else's reality. And you have to affirm that, and you have to acknowledge that, and you have to work through it, and you have to take account for it. You can't just say, I'm leaving, bye. I mean, I guess people do, but that's not good. And so, like, that's what, it, that's the, that's what the legislative process does. And this, from my time on the Hill, we, we forget this. The legislative process drives people towards agreement. It becomes almost impossible to stop once it starts. When I worked in the Senate for the steering committee, for conservatives, our job of the steering committee, part, partly, was to stop things that, that the members didn't like. When, well, how do you do that? You stop the process. Well, now the leaders start the process by stopping it. And we wonder why it takes so long to get going. I mean, it's, it, they make their job harder than it need be. Um, but I don't, I don't think that the, I think it partly is because members don't know any better. And I think it's partly because the environment is constructed in such a way to, to discourage them from venturing outside, so, so to speak. 
So yeah, I would agree that it's some of both. Um, and one thing that I put on the table that I don't think we've talked too much about so far is the degree to which um, the audience for the kind of procedural uh, conflict that we're talking about is not just in the chamber, it's outside the chamber. Um, and so, you know, if we think about what happened with DACA and, you know, when you characterize the shutdown as dumb, um, part of the, on one hand, um, if you're thinking about just what's the outcome of having done this within the chamber, um, there, you have one answer to that question. But if you think about, well, what's the outcome outside the chamber for having done this, I think you might get a different answer. And I'm of the mind that part of what drove that shutdown to happen was a uh, feeling on the minority side that the conflict had gotten sufficiently elevated, um, including by President Trump, that they really had no choice for their broader, uh, for the, the broader audience, um, except to go that route. Um, and so if, you are, um, if your goal is to you know, convince external audiences that you're serious about something, then uh, you're, you might get a different answer to that question. Um, so the external audience is more interested in the shutdown rather than the actual solution to the thing that would be shutting the government down? Um, it, that, can be, that can be true. May no, well. I think you're right. Yeah. I mean, so that's just the um, and so and I just think this, and this is, a, uh, this is important um, in thinking about pieces of James' argument as well. You know, um, one of my Brookings colleagues, uh, Sarah Binder, has been making this argument about the filibuster for years, which is that part of why we see increased use um, of the filibuster and other obstructive tactics in the Senate is because uh, interest groups and other outside audiences have come to expect that senators will exploit the procedural rights that they have in pursuit of policy goals. And once that's the expectation, it's so hard to go back in the other direction. And to say, no, I'm not going to um, agree to insist that we have a 60 vote threshold on this amendment when we've been doing it that way for several years, um, even uh, because that's the expectation that people have of what you're going to do. I actually think that I actually want to see if we can stay on that <clears throat> point for a minute, external actors, interest groups. You said members don't like to take tough votes. <clears throat> Why are they tough votes? And I want to ask you also, because you were at, at Heritage, which is an outside group. I know you weren't at Heritage Action, um, but you were in, in the more in the research side. But like thinking about what is the role of, of what role do outside groups have in, in creating this culture of no tough votes, and 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 to the extent that you have an understanding of, of how of, of whether there was any sense of consciousness of, of that at Heritage of, of creating and, and perpetuating that culture. Certainly, I, I, I can't speak to uh, to the culture or the thinking of the Heritage Action, <clears throat> but I, in the Senate, I think it's important to keep in mind that the outside groups don't play as large a role. When you represent 15, 20, 30 million people, even three or four million people, it doesn't matter what Heritage Action thinks. It doesn't. I mean, it, it, maybe there's some perception in your head as a member, psychologically, that it's going to matter. But the ability of outside of one or two outside groups on the left or the right to come in and sway um, a, 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 an entire state is, 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 is very hard, right? They're not worried about primaries? But even in, in, even in the primary situation, I mean, look at, look at what's happening, like in, in primaries in, in recent years. Um, but it doesn't mean that they don't have an impact, right? But I think my, my point is to say that the, it's, hard, it's harder than it is in the House. The outside game in the Senate is different, number one. In, in the way that the outside game manifests itself in the Senate is different than it is in the House. Um, I think the, the second point is that it, the influence cuts in both ways. Right? And so, yes, you may think, well, the senators don't have an interest in taking tough votes because of outside groups, but you would also expect that, you know, looking at the polarization thesis, everything we know about politics today and everything that tells us about politics today is that we have these members who all they care about are themselves, that they're using the Senate as a national stage, that they have their own fundraising networks, that they can, that they can appeal to all this, you know, media on the right or the left. Right? They can speak to true believers and no one else. They have every incentive to force those tough votes, but they're not. Why? That's, that's the interesting thing. I don't, I, I, 
So, you know, I get why, you know, like uh, Roger Wicker may not want to take a vote on something. I understand that. What I don't understand is why someone like Ted Cruz doesn't force those votes. Why Elizabeth Warren doesn't force those votes. That's what the polarization thesis doesn't explain to me. Why senators who otherwise ought to be polarized and have the resources to be polarized aren't using them to assert their prerogatives and their policy goals in the institution for selfish parochial reasons or not. It doesn't matter. They're not doing it. And I find that extraordinarily interesting. So one response I would have to that is that if you are a uh, relatively extreme senator in either party, you still have um, a vested interest in your party succeeding. And so if you are, for example, Elizabeth Warren, there's a reason to not force the Joe Mansions and the Heidi Hyde camps of the world to take certain votes because you know that your path to being in the majority party runs through some seats where getting uh, people elected for whom those votes are tougher votes uh, are that, that in order to become the majority or stay in the majority, you have to win those elections. And so to the extent, like, Yes, we have 100 individual senators and they have personal interests, but to the extent that they also have collective interests as part of their parties, I think that there's a degree to which avoiding tough votes serves the interest of the collective party goals. I think that's a great point, but even there, if you think about it, like Susan Collins doesn't want to be Rand Paul. Her voters don't want her to be Rand Paul. Enforcing her to take votes actually helps her, doesn't hurt her. What hurts the mansions of the world, what hurts the Collinses of the world and others is when they get lumped in with everybody else and they're not allowed to differentiate themselves. And especially if you're in the minority party, there's no, you know, if you're in the minority party and you're forcing the other side, you're forcing the Senate to take votes and you're Elizabeth Warren, for instance, like Manchin's gonna benefit from this differentiation here, right? It's not gonna hurt him. I mean, maybe there's you a primary You mean he can say he only voted with Chuck Schumer 30% or 50, 60% of the time? Oh, he can say, I didn't support X, Y, and Z. I'm not some crazy liberal. I'm, uh, I represent the people of West Virginia, right? I mean, that's, I think the parties, the members aren't the same and they don't want to be the same. And I think that, I think the problem arises when you have relatively safe seats, you know, where you're, where, you know, you have members who, nece who may not necessarily want to vote in line with their, what their constituents may want. And so if you're a Democrat representing a reliably Democratic state and you don't want to vote with Elizabeth Warren, well, it's probably because you're not very liberal. Okay, that's, I understand, but. Is the whole point of the Senate to keep that person in office? Or is the point of the Senate to actually resolve disagreements and let that person fight however they see fit to get reelected however they see fit? And the same thing with regard to reliably red states. Um, but I agree that the, but the, but the, but the mindset, I do think, is driving people to you know, not vote on things because then they've also um, overemphasized, I think, the extent to which votes can hurt them. I mean, I think there, I also think there's a sort of um, uh, kind of self-fulfilling prophecy that happens there, which is that you have, you want to take fewer tough votes, so you end up taking fewer votes, and then the votes that you do take, the salience of them is potentially increased because there are fewer of them, and so right. it just sort That's of keeps going. Question? Yeah, introduce yourself. Ron Bueller with Madison Coalition. I'd be interested in hearing from each of you if there is our one or two Senate rule changes that you'd like to see or one or two behavioral changes by leadership that you'd like to see uh, or maybe alternatively uh, one or two nuclear weapons that you'd like to see deployed uh, in pursuit of what you think would be a, a more functional Senate. My guess is that James is going to have some more specific things to point to than I am. But I think for me, the biggest um, challenge is that I think any one thing that you change at this point, whatever impulse that thing was allowing to get out into the world isn't just going to go away. It's just going to come out somewhere else. So I think a great example of this is you know, we have this new um, joint select committee on the budget and appropriations process. And I was reading a CQ story about their first meeting yesterday. And one of the ideas that they floated was um, eliminating the voterama at the end of um, consideration of the budget resolution in the Senate, which you know is this thing that senators complain a lot about. Um, they don't. It takes place in the middle of the night, and they vote on things, and they don't know what they are, and all this stuff. 
But the reason, part of what it gets used for is as an outlet for amendments that they aren't getting to offer elsewhere. <laughs> that, and so there are things they want to get done, and if that's the way they, if that's the place that gets to happen, like that's where they're going to go. Um, and so if you say eliminated that, their desire to offer certain amendments and to have votes on certain policy decisions isn't just going to disappear. They're going to try and figure out a different place to put that conflict. And so I think any um, rule change, procedural change, et cetera, you have to think about well, what the reason that you maybe don't like the way it's working now, where is that conflict and that um, those sort of impulses, where are they going to go if you uh, turn off that one, um, that one lever? So. 100% agree. And I think it's important to keep in mind the Senate doesn't follow the rules. So rules changes aren't going to fix anything. And so the question becomes, and I would also add that there's plenty of rules that they have now to address any of the problems they've faced so far as I can tell. But with that being said, so the question becomes, well, how do you fix the dysfunction so that they don't follow their rules in a more productive or deliberative manner, right? <laughs> and the way you do that is that you restore some sort of um, kind of parity between the power centers that, that be now and the rank and file. Not between the majority and the minority, but between the rank and file and the, and the leaders, basically. And how do you do that? Well, you basically have to encourage the rank and file or, and look to things that would basically encourage the rank and file to assert their rights, to empower them to participate in the process as they see fit. I outline in the book a third degree amendments, right? The, the tree's filled. Members are sitting around. They're complaining about it one day. I was like, well, why don't you just offer an amendment? Like, what do you mean? Well, just offer the amendment. We'll read, fill the tree. Well, so? It's just precedent. It's just an artificial construction. It's not in the rules anywhere. And it, it's just that we choose as the Senate to follow that precedent. But it changed. And when the Senate first started, you could only have two amendments pending. Well, now you can have a ton of amendments pending. Because the Senate decided that when those trees were too restrictive, it would expand them so that it would facilitate the orderly participation of members and their amendments in the process. Right? That's the whole point. Well, now the trees are being used to block that. So just change them. Force a vote. And what happens? Not that you see third degree amendments happening all the time, but that the majority leader all of a sudden says, wait a minute, if I keep filling the tree like this, maybe I'm not going to be able to do it anymore. And so they want to use it for extraordinary circumstances where it might be needed, I don't know. And so they will discipline their own use of it. But the only way they're going to do that is if the minority or the individual senators and the majority who don't agree with their leadership will challenge the leader and say, if you keep going down this road, we're going to take your power away. Right? And I think the fundamental problem in the Senate today is that it's, you have members who don't understand that the, the leadership works for them. Right? This is principal agent theory. You don't hire a plumber to, to, to fix your, you know, your a clog, and then like, they just decide that they're going to do something else completely, and you're like now beholden to them. You fire them if they don't do their job. But this idea of accountability is gone in, in the Senate today. And, and, and the whole thing is designed, again, to convince members not to assert their power. So if you, you have to deal with that. You have to readjust the, the power relationship and the way that they see the world. So it's not a rules problem. And just getting rid of the filibuster, you know, I'm not a, personally a big fan of the, the nuclear option for lots of reasons. That's a different conversation. Um, but one of the ironies of the whole thing is the way in which the leaders encourage members not to do this kind of stuff, the way they push back on the, um, the third degree amendments, for instance, is they say, if you do this, it's going to end with the nuclear option for the filibuster. That's what they say. They say, if you do this, it's going to be really bad for you. I know you think this is good for you now. What's, I, what's ironic about this is that they all, you can't have leadership control of the Senate without the filibuster. Because it, it sets up a process whereby you have to have unanimous consent to do anything. If you get rid of the ability to, um, to basically uh, to, to filibuster, what you're doing is you're removing any constraint a member who's not in step with the majority party has to not just offer third degree amendments or make rogue motions to proceed. The Senate, they defer to the majority leader since the 40s to make motions to proceed. Right? The reason why they do it is because the majority leader doesn't use that as a weapon against them. In the House, would you defer to the Speaker if you had the power not to? No, because the Speaker uses the rules against the minority. 
Well, that's what's happening in the Senate now. But the Senate, because the Senate is not in the House, because there is no speaker, they have an ability to take it back. And what's odd is that they haven't used that yet. And I think that eventually they will, because I think the electoral incentives will get so bad and things just can't fundamentally work in this way. You, you, you can't resolve really controversial stuff outside of public view, off the floor, in informal negotiations, member by member. It's just not going to happen. And I don't think the parties are particularly united today. And as long as this persists, I think it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And then eventually something will snap. And the second one member says, I want to do it this way, they're all going to say it. And the last thing I'll say is you saw in, in there was a precedent established in 2011, a motion to suspend the rules post closure for the purposes of offering an amendment. I forget if it was Coburn or DeMint was the first one to do it. Rule 22 says that when you're, if you don't have, if you haven't spoken at all during the 30 hours, the very last end of that time, you can have 10 minutes, but only for debate, if you haven't spoken at all before the vote. So the idea was you wait until the very end, and then you file this motion to suspend the rules. You suspend the part that says for amendment only, I mean for debate only, and you offer an amendment when you get recognized. Well, this was like a conservative thing to challenge Reid. Well, what happened right after they did it? I think Stabenow offered one, Sanders offered one. Members, ultimately, their individuality is going to come back out. The fact that they represent states and people that have expectations of what they ought to do in office is going to come back out. And it's going to be very, very hard to control. So I'm hopeful. Um, Bill Christian with Congressman Randy Weber's office. Um, James, you just said something that, that um, has been a concern in the, co in the context of the, the ending the filibuster argument, and that's that the Senate is not the House. It's been many, many years since I worked in the Senate, but when I did work there, um, my boss, Senator Phil Graham, was a big advocate of retaining the filibuster as a powerful minority, and I believe somewhat consistent with some of your advocacy of keeping the filibuster as well. Um, my question is that in, in the event that we do go nuclear eventually at some point, um, one of the concerns about going nuclear was that it would render the Senate being no different from the House. Whether or not that's a valid concern, I'll leave it to the scholars to determine. Do you think that that is the case? Or given what you explained earlier about the differences in the structure of the House and the Senate with, with, the, with the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate, does that still keep them different enough to, to obviate the, the, the downside of the nuclear option? It's a, a great question. Um, there, there are lots of differences, and Molly speaks and writes about this a lot as well. And the the, the six-year term, the staggered nature of, of, of the elections, uh, the constituencies, all of those things combine to make the Senate different than the House, um, separate and apart from its rules. So I think that's the first thing. It is important, though, that the difference be maintained internally in how it operates. There's a great passage, I don't know if it's Federalist 58, 59, 50, I forget. Anyway, there's a great passage where they, where Madison writes about what happens when you get, um, when basically the chambers get larger and larger. And 100 is pretty large, we forget that, it was 26 originally. And they begin to operate with, like, as like an oligarchy, basically. You have these leaders that basically come in and they end up doing things. So it looks bigger. And you have more people that are involved, but the decisions are made by fewer and fewer people. Um, he also says, I think if it's, um, maybe in the convention, if it's uh, Edmund Randolph or someone else, but they basically say that the key thing is that the Senate is different than the House. And it orders its proceedings differently. It orders its proceedings differently. So my point would be that, yes, you have states, you have constituencies, you have staggered elections, you have all these other things. But the Senate is, is a lot bigger than it was originally. You do have a national political environment in a way that we didn't have originally. Um, and I think that the filibuster in that environment helps approximate, at least, um, the original understanding of how the Senate should order its proceedings differently from the House, not necessarily deliberately, but just differently. It makes it different um, by reminding us of the importance of, of the minority and not only the minority, but the individual. It's not just minority rights, it's individual senators' rights and they can be out of step with their own party in the majority. And so I, I worry that it becomes more like the House if, if you get rid of the filibuster, if members don't ultimately do what I have described and assert their rights in a very aggressive way. But if you assume they will, then you don't need to get rid of the filibuster. 
In fact, I argue you can't get rid of the filibuster. And that's the, that's the, the kind of the catch-22. Uh, yes, James said, I am of the mind that uh, the sort of structural differences between the two chambers in terms of uh, staggered elections, the larger state-based constituencies, just make the task of being a representative in the Senate very different um, than in the House. And the other thing that I would add in the current uh, environment is that uh, eliminating the filibuster um, only matters, uh, I shouldn't say it only matters, but it matters whether there's fundamental agreement among a simple majority of senators on something that they would want to do in the absence of the filibuster. And so one of the things that I think we learned last year when uh, Senate Republicans made this choice to uh, construct a non-filibusterable agenda in large part is that it is true that the current majority agrees on some things and it is also true that they don't agree on other things and so if you um, even if you were to change the rules at the end of the day if you can't get 51 votes to do something like you're not going to be able to do that even in the absence of the filibuster And the agreement of 51 senators has to be sufficient and robust enough to withstand any retaliatory attacks from the minority using their rights that can't be new, right? I think that's the thing. While they all may agree on something, the question is do they all agree to the same level of intensity as well? Right. Yeah. And over there, please. Sorry, um, was curious what your thoughts are on the appropriations process in the Senate right now, or lack thereof, something you hear about a lot on this side, and if uh, you think anything on this budget supercommittee may have uh, changes that can help, uh, help them pass stuff. Um. Yeah, no, look, I think that the, the appropriations and budget process is broken. That's clear. I'm not entirely enthusiastic, I should say, about um, rules being changed to fix that absent the political will. Let's put it that way. Let's keep in mind that the Budget Control Act of 2011 is itself a budget process reform that was designed to lead to a more rational outcome. And the latest agreement to get around that created another process that they would come up with more ideas on how to have more rational and streamlined outcomes. So I'm not very optimistic about its success in the long term to the extent that things keep going like they are, but to the extent that it can figure out ways to help force these decisions, right, and force people to reckon with them, then I think it could have a chance to, to succeed. Instead of insulating those decisions from the conflict and the disagreement and trying to get them through the chamber, then I don't think it'll succeed. Yeah, I think for me, the um, biggest challenge, um, and you know, I think and write a lot about the budget and appropriations process, so I am, uh, I am uh, optimistic and hopeful that the committee will be able to do something. But the challenge for me is that because we've gotten to a point where the appropriations process in particular is the only thing that ever happens, it doesn't happen well, but it's the only thing that ever happens, it's being asked to bear a disproportionate amount of the political conflict in Congress. And so until you find a way to have some of that conflict get hashed out somewhere else, it's, by my mind, going to be really hard to prevent the appropriations process from being the place where that happens. Uh, you know, we see this with um, floor amendments in the House. Uh, we see it with amendments to the budget resolution in the Senate. And it's just, it's the place where members can take those conflicts that they want to hash out publicly. And until we find a way to um, give them a chance to do that elsewhere, I, uh, I'm concerned that it will continue uh, to struggle because it's being asked to do more than, um, uh, more than it should be. And one other option also is to just let them try hashing it out there too. I think the big secret we often overlook is the fact that the Senate doesn't even do that. Right? It's, you know, they say, well, we need biennial budgeting. Well, it, it's not a lack of time last time I checked. It's an unwillingness to even do the job, right? If you put a bill on the floor and you let people offer amendments and you can't get the votes to pass it and you're unwilling to change it, then yeah, maybe there might be an issue you gotta figure out, right? But right now it seems that the problem is that they don't even wanna begin to, to have the debate. And that's a problem because that's the point of the Congress, to have the debate. 
And senators offer the amendments. And if yes, if they are offering amendments that are imperiling appropriations across the board that are seen for whatever reason as not legitimate, then that's something they can debate and figure out how they want to do it. And, and in my experience too, senators, yes, they will try to go after things that are going to become law. But you also will, you also recognize that you don't have as much power. And so when the majority leader comes to you and says, look, can you please, I'll work with you on this. Can you, can you offer this in the next bill? But you're going to say yes. Because in the majority will say, maybe I'll give you, a, I'll help you get a hearing, and then I'm going to give you this next bill that comes up, which I know it's not, you know, we need to get this out. And you're going to think to yourself, do I want to push my, my decision to offer this amendment and really and go here, or I have the expectation of being more amendment opportunities in the future, to Molly's point, and so I'll use this hearing to help grow awareness of the issue, then I will offer the amendment on the next bill, and then maybe I'll get 20 votes, and then I'll get, and I have an expectation that after I build that for maybe after the next cycle to offer it again, and I'll get 30 votes. But because you don't have that expectation, there's no reason to trust anybody anymore. And so now you get in this kind of weird situation where everybody thinks that the whole place is gonna blow up. But um, when, you're in the when you're the minority or the majority and you're an individual senator and you have an amendment you wanna offer, it's not cost free. And you have to make these decisions, but they're your decisions to make. And I think the problem is that right now, the leadership on both sides is not allowing the members to make those decisions for themselves. Right, this comes back to um, the point that you make in the book and that I discussed earlier about credible commitment. So, you know, one of the things that we've seen, um, I think in both chambers, in the times in recent years when leaders have said, all right, we'll have a more open amendment process, is that members flood that opportunity. And they, uh, be in part because they're concerned that the, that opportunity isn't gonna come again. And so, um, again, in order to kind of make the appropriations process, for example, work better, I think you need a commonly understood credible commitment that there are going to be chances to do these things not in the appropriations process. Uh, Matt Gossman, Government Affairs Institute. Um, James, I'm very sympathetic to your argument to reinsert conflict in the Senate, but one thing that disheartened me greatly about the strategy, I mean, the strategy about the possible end result, was during the tax debate when the rubio Lee amendment got to the floor. And it seemed like that was an amendment that worked its way on the floor, and it by all means should have been one of these amendments that could have um, improved a bill and got a cross-party coalition, and it just utterly crashed because the Democrats wouldn't support it. Um, as I understood it, at the direction of Schumer, even though it seemed like a bill that would help them, and the reason they didn't support it was to be self-evident that this was only going to improve a bill uh, and give the Republicans a victory. And what I took out of that was that national partisan forces from the outside are perhaps overwhelming this sort of individuality in the Senate, such that even if you could get amendments on the floor, the party leaders would have such strong control, in part because what Molly said, that individual senators want to build the party brand and get the agenda set in control of the majority, that we're past the point where even the forces you're suggesting in reinserting the conflict could unwind this in a way that individuality sprung up on the Senate floor and created these cross-issue coalitions. Yeah. Yes and no, right? I mean, look, it, <laughs> I think they're not, the leaders aren't that powerful. Right? I, I don't want to beat up on the leaders too much. They're doing a hard job. They're trying to make do with very little um, ability to do so. I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, but at the end of the day, they're fighting a losing game. The parties are not unified, number one. Number two, they don't have the tools to enforce like discipline in the Senate. Right? Number three, they're not the most popular people in their parties, either inside the Senate or outside, right? I mean, this is not a great place to be. And so I don't, if you are, if there is an issue, right, and if you have a more deliberative process, a more inclusive process where these issues are percolating and the people care about them, the, my experience is that things tend to go in the direction that the people want them to go. It may not be perfect over time, but they typically head in that general direction. And they do so because the people can see what's happening and then they can replace members who are doing things they like or don't like with, thing, with members who are doing things they like. And so if you have a situation like this Lee Rubio amendment, and there are members in the minority party who agree with it and support it, you can only vote against it so many times, right? If your constituents also want it. Like that's just the fundamental reality. And so that's where I think the open process ultimately is, it undermines leadership control in that way. And 
but it leads to more things passing. And this is the irony. I mean, we talk about we talk about this situation like it's somehow new. I think the Senate's been here before, um, although not as bad, in the late 50s and early 60s. You know, we, re we remember Lyndon Johnson as the master of the Senate, but he led a Senate that was bounded in time, and he got his power from a certain institutional structure. Well, it was already changing by the time he left for the White House. And had he stuck around, I suspect that we would remember him very differently because he couldn't lead the Senate of the 60s like he led it in the 50s. I think Mitch McConnell is trying to lead the Senate of today, of Mike Mansfield's time, like Lyndon Johnson's Senate of the 1950s. It's not going to work. Thankfully, in the 60s, Mike Mansfield comes in. And regardless of whether or not you agree with all these different legislative things that happened in the 60s and 70s, Mike Mansfield comes in and he has the humility to recognize that the old way won't work anymore. And so he says, I can't control this place, and he focuses on facilitating the participation of members in the process. You see more filibusters, you see more holds, you see all the things people complain about today. They're starting here and really increasing. But then you see some of the most incredible legislative productivity that this nation has ever seen in the same period, in the 60s and in the 70s, with this model of leadership. And that's the secret. It's counterintuitive. It doesn't make any sense. If you're sitting in the leadership office, you cling to things that you think work when you're in an uncertain environment. And that's what's happening now. The leaders don't know how to make the Senate work. They fundamentally don't know how to do it. Because the secret is stop trying. Right? Literally, stop trying to control everything. Just let go. It will work. And then, yes, if you are liberal or conservative, it's going to be tough. And some things that may happen that you may not like. But last time I checked, liberals and conservatives are generally okay with casting votes. They're generally okay with fighting really hard. And that's the way it should be because this country isn't set up to like guarantee outcomes for one person over the other. And I think that's the fundamental, I, I do think I'm, I remain an optimist because I don't think the situation can continue. And the great thing about being in a democratic republic is that the people ultimately get a say. And sooner or later, and I've been saying this since 2006, we're gonna hit rock bottom. <laughs> and sooner or later, they're gonna, it's just gonna, the people will come here who will just have no, no expectation to follow through with the culture. I mean, look what happened in the Senate. Just, it was an extraordinary change with the little bit that happened in the elections of 2010 on the Republican side. It was extraordinary. It's only like four people. That's the kind of impact that you can have. And I think now it'll be interesting to watch that play out on the Democratic side in a way that it hasn't in the past because of the power of the presidency. Um, but they're in the minority now, and I think it'll be interesting to watch. Yeah, so I think I generally agree with you, Matt. And um, so for me, the question is, what differentiates situations where, in this example, the minority party is willing to line up behind its leadership and not vote for something like the Rubio-Lee amendment? and when it is. And I would sort of draw a contrast with what's happening currently on this Crapo banking bill, which is one of the first things that's actually begun to expose um, some potential divisions within the Democratic uh, caucus in the Senate, in this Congress. Uh, and I don't have a great answer to what it is about that that is um, surfacing uh, Democrats who are willing to vote differently from their party than, say, the Rubio Lee Amendment was. My suspicion is that some of it is about kind of the visibility and the salience of the tax debate um, and the degree to which the fact that Republicans were using the reconciliation process meant that Democrats could sort of wash, you know, wash their hands and say they have made a procedural choice that absolves us of any responsibility to work together. Um, but that, so, those, so um, that's where I think we go next and sort of try to figure out um, what leads one thing to happen versus the other. <laughs> Any questions? Or, or, yeah. Laura Light? Uh, Laura Light Kelly from Beck Center at Georgetown. Thank you both. I love listening to you. Um, I have a question about the election coming up in November. You know, uh, there are expectations that it will be a wave election. And my fear is it's going to be not just a wave, but a protest election where a lot of people got elected because of running against the institution or running against DC. And, and, um, what do you think that? The House could do, especially um, to, to set the tone of sort of optimizing just collegiality and optimization of what can happen within the sort of conventions of the institution to get it going again. Because I have a feeling that will also be one of the election platforms is going to DC to fix things. And they really need to be listening to you in order to get this place moving forward at all. 
do you have any sense of that? Has anybody been writing about that? Like getting them maybe to commit to institutional values before they get here? Yeah. Um, and I, I suspect Molly and I may disagree slightly on this. I'm not sure I'm the best person to make recommendations about collegiality because I think my fundamental thesis is that um, it, like I don't, I, I don't think collegiality is necessarily a good, I think a lot of the frustration you're seeing right now with Congress is this idea that there's, there's no difference. You know, we're in this weird environment where the parties are polarized but yet people are like, but there's no difference between the parties, right? This just doesn't make sense. And I think a lot of it is that, you know, this idea that we can somehow resolve these really tough issues in a very collegial way, in a big, divided country that is diverse with lots of different viewpoints, right? That's a strength, remember, for Madison. That's a strength. But it's, it's really hard to get consensus, and that's a good thing. Madison tells us that prevents tyranny. So I don't know. The way you get collegiality is that you end up treating each other as an equal. And the only way that you can treat each other as an equal is if you show that you have an ability to hurt the other person, right? That, and the only way that you have your ability to increase cost for them, that you have an ability to, um, to also play. Otherwise, the, in the, with regard to the Senate, the majority is just going to run roughshod over the minority. Every amendment is a poison pill amendment when you're in the majority. Every minute beyond a vote is a minute too long when you're in the majority, right? And so you can't leave it to the majority to make decisions on what is an appropriate amount of time to debate. And I think with regard to collegiality and institutional norms, the Senate has had extraordinary periods of lawmaking in the past. And, and out of those periods has, arose, has arisen new norms. But I think we talk about norms today in a way that forgets that they're constructed over time. And they change. And they're meant to be more flexible than law. That's the whole point of norms. And they adjust and they, in, to new situations. And so the question is, are we, do we need to change the norms we have today? And I think in many respects we do, um, because I think what's happening in the country is an indication that the people aren't happy with them. And so I think it's more about showing enough robust debate that can, people can see their claims adjudicated here in Congress, and then whatever happens in the election is going to happen in the election. But I think once you get that robust debate happening, and once they see their claims being adjudicated, then I think you'll start to see it pick up, and we're going to head in a new direction. And then you'll see new norms settle in around that and then things will come back to a more stable period. So I think for me, it's less about, um, than it is for James, about providing space for more conflict, and it's more about establishing a set of um, consistent expectations about uh, the idea that there will continue to be opportunities to adjudicate the conflicts that you have. Um, and so, again, com coming back to, you know, we've seen several times new leaders, we've had a change in party control in either chamber, and a new leader has come in and said, I'm going to do things differently, and they have done that once or twice, and then something has happened, and they've, you know, gone right back in the other direction. And so, I think, and um, I suspect this isn't inconsistent with sort of James's argument, which is that in order to uh, have a more productive process, you need everyone to believe that they're going to continue to have opportunities to have input and to decrease their incentive to try to cram all those opportunities into just one or two uh, chances that come at the beginning of a Congress, which is part of what leads the process to break down quickly. All right, well, I think we can uh, one, one, one quick question and then we'll wrap it up. Sorry, uh, Mike Stern, uh, blogger, I guess. Um, so, uh, let me just, uh, listening to your whole discussion here, and a lot, I mean, a lot of it makes great sense. The one thing I'm still trying to figure out, I, I can understand why Elizabeth, why the system works for Elizabeth Warren and Ted Cruz and, and people of that ilk. I can't quite figure out why it works for Joe Manchin and Doug Jones and Susan Collins. We have a Senate that's almost perfectly divided at this point with, I believe, a couple of members who are not really participating much, right, because of health. So it seems like one person, I mean, anyone could just come in and, and change the conversation if they wanted to from, from the middle. There's something stopping, that, stop, stopping anyone from coming forward and even saying, I want to do you know, something that neither side likes 100%. And I'm gonna and, and I'm gonna push for that. There, there's a cost of of doing that 
even for these senators who are the moderate senators from states that maybe lean the other way. Can, can you, exp I, I can't really explain exactly why that is, but it seems to be the case. I can't either, except to say that I think it's a really important question. Um, and the thing that I, as a result, take away from not having a clear answer is that there, mu there must be something. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, it's part of what's stopping us from changing the current arrangement. I mean, I think the, the simplest explanation is they don't have the opportunity to do so. I mean, when uh, you're Susan Collins, you want to change uh, something, what are you going to offer an amendment to? What are you going to, what are you going to, um, you know, what are you, it, it, you, the, the process doesn't allow for individual members to bring their influence to bear on anything because there's not, I mean, the Senate's been in post closure time all year, basically, on noms. Right. The floor has been locked down. So senators have no ability to exert any kind of um, policymaking um, capability. They just don't. I mean, I don't, they basically come to DC to eat lunch with their colleagues and go home and be told what to do. <laughs> I mean, the At least they vote in the House, right? Yeah, but they've got Twitter accounts. I mean, yeah. the, I mean, the president seems to drive the agenda with 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 the tweet. I mean, they don't want to. I mean, they, there's a cost of just stepping out, even if it has nothing to do with being on the floor, just going on TV or whatever, to say, you know, to call attention. They want to stay. They they don't want any attention to themselves, as far as I can tell. There, because there's something that if they <laughs> separate from the herd, something's going to happen. They're worried at least that something's going to happen. To them. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.